Well, you know, the Bible says if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. So we're going to receive from, from Apostle Luke Van der Wheeling right now. So we're going to receive that. Thank you. Um, last week, Pastor Jeff shared with us a defining word for the church. I, I really believe that. And, and so if you weren't here last week, I encourage you to see Jeff afterwards and say, can I have a copy of Sue's message from, from last week? And so what I want to frame around this week is very much take up where Sue kind of left off last week. So, But before I do that, I, I certainly want to recap um, a little bit of the ground that Sue covered last week, so just for those of you that weren't there, um, so you kind of get a sense of, of where we're at. So I'm just going to touch on a few things, not going to dig down to the depth that Sue did last week, but just some, some thought provokers for you, but please get that, that video. So, um, so I want to I speak today about re, re-digging your well, re-digging your well. Redigging your personal well. Sometimes <coughs> beware of those carrying shovels, right? So, so Sue opened up Genesis 26 for us and she, she really unpacked that, brilliantly unpacked that for us. And, and essentially it's, it's the story of, of Isaac redigging the wells of his father Abraham. And we find in verse 2, verse 4, there's the promise, there's the promise of blessing, right? And so, so God comes to Isaac and says, you know, because of your father Abraham, because of the covenant relationship of your father Abraham with me, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to bless you so that the blessing I release to you through you all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. And so that's, that's the premise right there in the opening verses of the chapter is God says, I want to come and I want to bless you. I want to cause you to prosper. I'm going to cause you to grow. I'm going to cause you to thrive. And then he goes on, you know, what Isaac doesn't sit on his laurels. He, he actually goes to work. And sometimes we can, you know, there's the promise of blessing and we're just going to sit here and go, I'm going to receive blessing, you know. It's going to come out of thin air. But Isaac actually, he goes to work and he digs a well. He re-digs a well that had been opened by, so he starts to get on. He said, God, you're going to bless me, but right now I'm going to do some work. And so he blesses the work of our hand and he opens up this well. And what happens is he begins to thrive, he begins to prosper. His cattle's increase, his servants increases. There's blessing pouring out of this man's life because he's opened the well. And what happens is the people around about start to look at this guy and there's jealousy in their heart. This guy's thriving, this guy's prospering. And if we're not careful, He's going to take over the whole world. And, and he's going to squash us. And so what do they do? These little Philistines come along with their little shovels. And it says they threw dirt in his well. They filled up his well. Now that doesn't, you know, when God comes and promises blessing, right? And I want to tell you, there's a promise of blessing over each one of you. There's a well inside each one of you. And the enemy says, hey, be blowed if I'm going to sit here and watch you be blessed. Be blowed if I'm going to sit here and let you prosper. I'm going to throw dirt on your well. And what, what, does, what does he do? He digs another well. And Sue went through this last week. In fact, he digs three other wells. One, Essek, which means argument. Sitna, which means hostility, and Reboeth, which means an open place in which to prosper. And the great thing that Sue brought out last week was known every time the enemy would come in and build a well, and that the enemy would come in, so this time they wouldn't fill it with dirt, this time they're saying, hey, that's our water. 
And he, he just walked away. He didn't get into contention, he didn't get into argument, but there was a humility in his heart, he just walked away. So I go through this, so the lesson of Isaac's humility, every time there was an argument, he just walked away. But there's this pattern, every time a well opens, the enemy comes in, I'm going to fill it with dirt, I'm going to fill it with argument, I'm going to fill it with jealousy, I'm going to fill it with dissension, I'm going to fill it with discouragement. But Isaac just keeps going. He says, ah, I don't care. I'll just go and dig another one. So, <coughs> Sue then started to unpack the call on our church. And she, she articulated it in a, in a way that, that we haven't, I think, had a handle on before. But the, the call on us as a church is to, is, to, is to break open ground so that others can prosper. To break open ground so others can prosper. Now that's, that's a really good thing because most of the time it's like, I'm going to break open ground so I can prosper, so I can be blessed, so I can be fulfilled. But... There's a sense that God's just been drawing us into this season in terms of his blessing on us is for others to prosper. And so we've been talking about this whole concept of, of reading the world. Now, the next bit is in your newsletter. And if you want to get your newsletter out, you can read it. I encourage you to read it. As I said, get the full DVD from last week. All right? So this is just Sue's summary of where we're heading as, as a church, okay? So we are a people called to worship, prayer, and intercession. We're called to stand in the gap, serving the churches, the city, and the nations to take up this mission. We need to be strategic in our approach as the Lord desires to share mysteries of his kingdom that will be outworked and expressed in this city. So that's in your newsletter down the bottom. We are a company of burning hearts, forerunners, unsung heroes who don't chase the limelight, but are in essence the firelight that keeps the city awash with his presence and with formation fire. We are a company of believers called to serve the city, the churches of the city, and the nations through worship, prayer, and intercession, redigging the ancient wells of reformation and establishing a beachhead of his presence releasing the redemptive call over this city and the nations. Who got excited when they heard that last week? A few, yeah, I thought, I, I, a few of us got excited. That's all right. I, I, hope, I hope something arose in your spirit and said, yes. Said, yes, I want to be, I want to be a part of this. I'm going to, I'm going to commit my life to this. I'm going to, I'm going to invest in prayer. I'm going to invest in my finances. I'm going to invest in my time because I just sense this is, this is God's, God's focus for us in this hour and this season in which we live. And so I want to, I want to have a quick look now at the, the redemptive call. Of the city, so I'm going to drill down to the kind of big picture, and then we'll get down to tin tacks. Okay, so come on the journey with me. So this is the call on us as a church, and, and so we've been talking about the call of the city, the city of, of Frankston, and, and Mark has has unpacked a lot of that over the last few months, and a bit here and a bit there, and so you'll you'll recognise some things in in here, right? So I'll just put them in order. So first of all, we are a city of firsts. And uh, Max unpacked a lot of the firsts of our city. And even though Frankston has got this, this reputation of being a city of, of no hopers, of down and outers, of of drunkards or whatever label is put upon us from the outside, there is the real fact that we are in fact a city of entrepreneurs. And 
So that, that is, is one of the, the key aspects of, of God's redemptive call on our city. And I won't unpack all the firsts, but if you can re reflect to some of the stuff that Mark's shared over the last couple of years, there's all of these things that started in our city. And so the enemy has come along and said, hey, you're going to be a city of entrepreneurs, are you? Well, I'm going to throw some dirt on your well. I'm going to put some dissension on your well. I'm going to mess with your well. I'm going to start to mess with your identity. I'm going to mess with the way that people perceive you. Now, talking city, but talking ourselves. We're a, we're a creative city. So that's really interesting. So Mark unlocked the door for the creative this morning. So we, we are a city that, that loves art. We've got a beautiful art gallery. We have sand sculptures on the beach. And we, we're, we're a city that's, that's steeped in art and music. Isn't that interesting? So we're a, we're a healing city. And Mark's again, unpack this through. You remember the, the Chelmonite and the springs and the wells in the early days. This was, a, this was a place where people would come for rest and for restoration and for healing. You know. We have the Frankston Hospital. This is a, is a, a premier hospital in our city. Right? It's a, it's a central place for the entire peninsula. We have an amazing healthcare system. We have some of the top professionals in their field are actually located here in Frankston. Some people think, oh, I've got a, I've got a trip all the way into the city and the big city hospitals. But actually all of these top guys are right here in our city. I had, I had a more specialist, so I kind of come in point here. I walked in, you know, my dad walked into the Alfred Hospital, and there's, there's the doctor that I see on a regular basis. So I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just here for a few ops, you know. But he's, he's got his practice right here in town. So it's like, wow. So you're the top guy here, and you're, you're in our city. Isn't that interesting? So we're a, we're a caring city. And, and, you know, even with city life and, and everything that's, that's happened, there is this continued cry for the city to be cared for, for the, for the, for the disadvantaged to be cared for, for the, for the hungry to be fed, for the disconnected to be connected, for the, for the lonely to find connection. And so there's this, this incredible heart within our city and you know, Mark, we're constantly saying, when, 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 when are you going to do something? You know, when are you going to do something? And so there's this, there's this anticipation that we're going to do something and we are going to do something. We're, we're little discussions going on that hopefully in the early part of next year we can actually share something with you. So, but we want to continue to care for our city. It's a, it's a space that we have, we have spearheaded and people still looking to us for, for leadership in that space. You're looking at, Christmas lunch again, which is which is going to be really exciting this year. So we've got a, a caring city. We've got a, a city a city that's built for training. You know, Frankston High School is is one of the top high schools in the state. It's in the top ten percent of high schools. And if you want to. You want to buy a house in the, in the Frankston High School zone, you're going to pay an extra $100,000 to buy a house in the Frankston High School zone. That's like, okay, so there's, there's a value on, on the education system in our city. We have, we have Monash University with a campus. We have Chisholm with a campus. And so there's this sense that this city with such a poor reputation is in fact a center of excellence for for education and for training one of the wells of our city 
So now I find it really interesting. I'm going to have a look at that, that list now and look at us as a, as a church, the history of us as a church. We, we actually play in each of those spaces. Yeah. We've been talking of laid around the seven mountains. This is just another way of looking at it, okay? But we have people with an entrepreneurial gift right here in the church. We have people with a creative gift right here in our church. We have people with a, a healing gift right here in our church. We have people with caring hearts. And we have training, you know, that's part of our, our DNA as a church. And, and it will be part of our future again because that's the nature of an apostolic house is to train and to equip and to release. And so even though we're not doing it right now, I really believe the time will come in the next year or two that we're going to reclaim that space in training. We'll do it a little differently, but but there is a sense that we are, we're a well for education and for training, you know. And so, you know, I've got Steve here in the front row, you know, pioneering stuff, you know. And so even Steve, I just you know, really feel like this is a new season for you and the, and the thing that you struggle with and you've you, you, you paid a price for, you know, God's going to kind of bring honour upon you in this next season and there's a sense, there's a credibility upon you that you don't even realise or recognise and I think there's a, there's a credibility that's going to increase as the Lord takes you into this new season. Thank you for that, Father, right now in Jesus' name. You know, but so there's there's all of us together, and we could there's more. But this is the essence of the redemptive call of our city. And so, in prayer, in worship, we've been starting to to target these things. Now, the area of of, of government and leadership, you know, that's up there with that one. You know, it's got a pioneer. So the council, as Mark keeps saying, is in this place of of division. And in fighting, because the enemy wants to come and pour dirt on that well. And, and if you look at all of these things, the enemy wants to come in and pour dirt on the education sector, wants to pour dirt on the health sector, wants to pour dirt on our ability to care and, and train. And so, what does that do? That brings discouragement. So, let's give up. Let's give up. But the tenacity of Isaac was that he continued to reopen the wells established by his father, Abraham. And so, right now, we could, we could give up on all this stuff. It would be very easy for Mark Sue himself and Alicia just to walk away sometimes. But there's a recognition that God has called us to do something that's that's significant, but it's a little different and it's a little out of the ordinary. And so I pray that as we've been at, you're trying to articulate this, as we've been trying to get a sense of trying to get a handle on God, where where are you taking us? That that you're actually coming on that journey with us. And, and I know most of you are, you know. But I want to encourage you, if you're not quite, you just kind of What's going on in this place? It's so weird. It's so different. Is that you? That you really start to see God and say, God, what is it that you're doing here? What is it that that you want me to do? What's my part here? You know, and maybe it's in one of those fields to to, to help dig one of those wells in the city, to help redig one of those wells, and to, to have an influence. Okay, so we're. Let me. Now, as Sue was sharing this last week, you know, some of you were already starting to to join the dots, which I love. You know, afterwards, it's got people talking and chatting and going, okay, so there's a well. There's a call on us as a church. There's a call on us as a city. There's a well of the city. There's a well of the church. And that has, a, has an impact on, on me. I'm actually 
actually part of the city. I'm actually part of the church. And so you can't divorce yourself. You can't cut yourself off from the thing that's happening in the city, the thing that's happening in the church is most likely happening to you. And so for most of us, we've been walking through a season of transition. We've been walking through a season of change. We've been walking through a season of metamorphosis because that's what God's doing in the city. That's what God's doing in the heart of the church. And that's what he wanted to do in us individually and personally. And so if you're feeling unsettled, there's a reason you're feeling unsettled. Because we're not in a settled place, we're in a place of change and we're in a change of growth and development in terms of where God is taking us. The church is a well, the city is a well, you are a well. God comes to Abraham and says, through you, Abraham, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Comes to the ice and makes the same promise. And he begins to dig a well. Can I suggest that if you're feeling discouraged, if you're feeling confused, if you're feeling powerless, if you're feeling disheartened, if you feel like giving up, perhaps. There's a Philistine that's come along with a shovel of dirt and wants to start to fill your well. Perhaps he's half filled your well or perhaps he's completely filled your well to the point you're going, oh God, I don't know what to do anymore. I just feel like giving up and walking away. Well, that's his exact plan. That's his exact strategy. See, he never, he never changes. So, I want to have a bit of a think about your own well, your own life, and get very personal around the state of your well. How is your well looking? What's the purpose of your well? What is the purpose of your life? Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now that's a pretty amazing claim. And it was a, it was a promise that came to a guy who had no kids. That's like, that does your head in. I don't know about you, it does your head in. It's like, all right God, through me, all the nations of the earth be up, but I've got no kids. And so the promises of God have, have come to us, right? And we've got promises, promises, promises. The promises of God have come to me in so many ways. And yet everything in my life screams the opposite to the reality of where I'm at. Because there's some Philistine with a shovel. Nah. There's no way knowing you're stepping into those promises. There's no way knowing you're ever going to see those promises. He's out to discourage. And so what's the purpose of your well? There we go. Well, we did pretty well, Carol. I want to, I want to just keep that. I'll just quickly jump on in. Sorry about this. So the purpose of your well initially is, is a place of, of personal blessing. And so your well is, is to be a place of blessing for yourself. There we go. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So that Genesis 26 to 4. Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, right? But 
there is a there is a sense that it's it starts with a place of personal blessing. You cannot you cannot be a blessing to anybody else unless you're actually living in a place of blessing. If you're living in a place of security. Now Proverbs 5:15 is a, a well-known passage. I'll read this for you. It says, "Drink waters from your own system, running water from your own well." Now this. It speaks about marriage. It's a whole passage about marriage, but the principle is there. The well, your well, is for you. Running water from your own well. The Message Bible says, Do you know the saying, drink from your own rain barrel, draw water from your own spring thread well? And I like that phrase, spring thread well. It's true. Otherwise, you may one day come home, find your barrel empty, and your well polluted. So, first point, your well is a place of personal blessing. It's a place of personal nourishment for you. It's a place of personal satisfaction. Secondly, a well is then a place of blessing for others. I want you to have a look at a couple of scriptures. I'll read John 7, 37, 39. This is Jesus speaking. It's a well-known verse. Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For scripture declare, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He's speaking of the Spirit, right? But the picture is that from a well, you'll receive a spring. And the spring will come to life, and the spring will turn into a river to all those around you. So Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, coincidentally, sitting beside Jacob's well, says this, anyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. It will become a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving eternal life. So there's this sense, you drink, you receive, and that becomes a wellspring. Out of it, it begins to flow. You're going to become a gusher. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And you need to start to see yourself in that light. You need to start to value your own life in that light. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So Ezekiel 47 is a well-known passage. It's known as Ezekiel's River. But let's have a think about what happens with Ezekiel's River. There is, there is the temple. There's the description of the temple. It's the place where God dwells. And Ezekiel starts to describe what he sees. And he says the water flows out of the temple. From the presence of God, the water flows. He measures out. It's up to my ankles. It's up to my knees. It's up to my waist. There's waters to swimming. What's the source? The source is the presence of God, right? And the further you get out from the presence of God, the water flows. It gets deeper. Then what does it do? It, it, it then touches... Everywhere it goes, and it says life comes. Out of the river, life comes. Where there were no fish, suddenly there are fish. Where there were no animals, suddenly there are animals. Where there were no trees, now are these amazing trees that grow on the side of the river. They're being impacted by the river. The river that comes from the throne of God, the river that comes from the presence of God, flows, it gets deeper, and life comes. Yeah. Yeah. Now let's have a look at verse 12. It says, Fruit trees of all kinds will flow along both sides of the river. 
The leaves of these trees will never turn brown and never fall, and there will always be fruit on the branches. There will be a new crop every month. What a cool tree. A new crop every month. Where does it come from? Does it come from the tree? Does it come from the water? Or does it come from the presence that flows from the temple? Amen. All of it. But it starts with his presence. It flows out of his presence. And you might think right now, why are we spending so much time in prayer? Why are we having three parents? We should be getting on and doing other stuff. We should be running programs. We should be out there touching the community and trying to get things started. Make things happen. But Ezekiel says it flows from the throne. It flows from the presence of God. And if we're there, we're saying, God, change us. God, touch us. Cause us to be that river. Cause us to be in that river. And then out of us, God, it's going to flow your goodness to all those around us. And we're going to bring life into places that were dead. We're going to bring order into places of chaos. We're going to bring healing into places of sickness because that's where the river flows. And people are going to say, oh, wow, these trees are amazing. But it's not the tree. And the recognition will be it's not the tree. It's not me, guys. It's not me. It's not you. It's to him so that he gets the glory. It's always him. And he's got us to this place right now that we are so, so dependent. We're, you know, I've never been as more dependent on God as I've ever been in my life. Because he's brought me here. He's humbled us. He brought us. Our world has come crashing out and around us. But there's this record, God, I need you. I need your direction. I need your provision. I need your grace. I need your mercy that I find in your presence. So a well is the place of blessing for you as a person. It's a place of blessing as an individual. And you will, yeah, your well is unique. Your personal well is unique. And so sometimes we're so looking at Lena's well and saying, hasn't Lena got an amazing well? Lena has an amazing well. But it's not your well, it is Lena's well. You have an equally amazing well. You know. And so, so the call is on Lena to, to unstop her and to become all that she's called to be. And the call on Lena is that you become all that you are called to be. Now have a think about this. The well in our city is a city of firsts, right? So that's, that's our... Inheritance, a city of firsts. If we step into that, we're going to be part of a church of firsts. Our inheritance is that we are a people of firsts. If I'm a person of firsts, that means I'm going to go where no man has gone before because we're pioneering something, we're breaking something open. And if I'm a person of firsts, living in a city of first, and a church of firsts, and I'm breaking open new ground, what's that going to cause? Some measure of discomfort. Because we don't, we don't have a roadmap. We don't have a comparison point that says we're going to look like this because this doesn't exist. What we're stepping into doesn't exist. It's not been created before. It's not been formed before. It's not been made before. And we're looking around going, nobody else is doing anything like this. This is scary. But God says, hey, I'm calling you to pioneer new ground. I'm calling you to unstop the well of the city. 
I'm calling you to unstop the wells of the churches and I'm calling you to unlock your personal wells so that you can step into your destiny, so you can start to step into everything that God has called you to be. But God, I've got my kids. How is this going to happen? It's the same way that the trees bring forth a different crop every month. It's out of his presence. It's out of his presence. In the time of the judges, the Israelites were led by the judges. They would hear God for the nation. But there came a point in time where they said, That nation's got a king. That nation's got a king. That nation's got a king. They come to Samuel and they say, Samuel, we need a king. Because every other nation's got a king and we don't have a king. What did they start to do? They started to compare themselves with everybody else. And Samuel comes to God and says, God, what's going on? And the Lord said, they haven't, they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. And I'll give them a king. And they ended up with a sword. And so even though it was against God's heart, he gave them what he wanted. Saul messed up a bit, but praise God, there came a David, a man after God's own heart. But they didn't appreciate their uniqueness. They didn't put a value on the uniqueness of their wealth. They wanted to look like every other nation. And we can be right now saying, we want to look like another church. A church that's a bit more comfortable. A church that's a bit more traditional. A church that's not so out there. A church that's not quite so crazy. A, a church that thrums, you know, sings three hymns and has announcements within the first 15 minutes. We're not a church like We'll never be a church like that because we're pursuing Him, we're pursuing His presence. The purpose of your wealth, a place of personal blessing, a place of blessing for others, and the value of your own uniqueness. I'm going, I realise I'm going a bit longer. I'll quit go through this quickly. How to look after your wealth, first of all, to value it and to be attentive to your wealth. You know, and the quickest way for your wealth to start to collapse is to not value it and not put time into it. I don't know if you've ever been to the beach and you start digging in the sand and there's, there's water that starts to bubble up. If you go for a walk and you come back half an hour later and you go, where's the water gone? The sand's caved it in, you know. So because we haven't we haven't valued the well, we haven't we haven't used it. And, and, and for the well to stay open, you need to you need to keep digging and you need to keep drinking and you need to that thing to keep flowing through you. And the moment water becomes stagnant in the pipe, and things crud starts to get in and starts to block up the pipes. And so for your well to be healthy, we need to pay attention to it, we need to value it. We need to beware of Philistines carrying shovels. What has stopped up your well? And I want you to think about your own heart for a moment. About the promises of God for your life. Dreams that you've had, hopes that you've had, <coughs> crushed, gone, defeated. 
maybe through lack of use, maybe through discouragement, maybe through lack of appreciation. Or perhaps you feel like your world has been rejected. Perhaps the thing that you carry is just not being valued by others. Perhaps weariness. Perhaps carelessness. Or perhaps you've made a mistake and it could be a million other reasons why your well has locked up in this season. You see, before we can uncap the wells of others, our own well needs to be in really, really good shape. And this is, this is a journey that I've been on over the last 10 years now as God trying to get my well into shape to some sort of level where it can again be a, a blessing to, to myself but also to those around me, to those that are in my sphere of influence. And there are people in my sphere of influence that are not in your sphere of influence and vice versa. But it needs, it needs a well that flows. It needs a well that becomes a wellspring, a source of life, a source of blessing, a source of hope to those around you. And so it's all right talking about it as a church, you know, but who makes up the church? It's us, it's you, it's me. And so in this last season, it's, it's been, you know, there's been a lot of healing in my heart. There's a lot of pain that's been there. And you know what that does? It, it messes with the water. And people start to drink from it. They go, oh, that's full of bitterness and that's full of anger and that's full of judgment and that's full of other crud. People don't like drinking from that sort of stuff. But out of your innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. And perhaps it's your, it's your art. Perhaps it's your care for the poor. Perhaps it's your, your educational gifts. Perhaps it's your painting gift. Whatever that thing is that burns inside you. I want to I wanna unlock it for you this morning. I want to see God come and say, restore vision, restore hope. And if you're looking for the church to do it, the church is not going to do it. We're not going to set up a program, right, for you to run into or run through. This is, this is the nature of an apostolic church. This is the nature of an apostolic hub. All the stuff that we've been talking about is that we are in initiators and influencers of the world around us. And as you start to step out, and as you start to pioneer, as you start to dig the well of, of, of God in your life, you're going you're gonna to start to open up. And God's going to cause you to be a blessing to yourself and to the world around you. So get rid of the things that have blocked your well. I shared with, I'm out of time, but I really, I really want to share this. You know, my recent trip, and I'll, I'll be very brief, before I went, I said, God, I really want to know what my future looks like. And I packed in my suitcase three significant prophetic words that have come to me over the last three years. Promises. And I thought, I'll sit with Darren Canning in Singapore and I'll have two weeks with Darren and I'll get Darren to read them and I'll get his, I'll get his intake, his input on what, what I should do with these words, you know. And God set me up. <laughs> and you guys know the story, right? Two days before I'm supposed to be in Singapore, Darren rings me or messages me and says, I'm really, really sorry I'm not going to be there. And so it leaves me with a problem. I have a church in Singapore that doesn't know me. I don't know them. And so I miss you to say, hey, so I'm really sorry, but Darren's not coming. They cut a long story short. And they say to me, well, what can you speak? And I go, I'm not Darren. I don't carry Darren's well. 
I don't have Darren's anointing. I don't have Darren's grace. And so intimidation comes. I'm not Darren. These guys are coming looking for Darren and all I've got to offer is me. They say, come. And I miss a minister on a, on a Saturday. I've never spoken for more than an hour. Almost over two hours I taught and spoke. I never spend more than half an hour on an altar call. Over three, four hours I prayed for people and saw God come and saw God minister to them and saw God change their lives and saw God bring encouragement to their hearts in ways that I cannot begin to imagine. But I know it wasn't me. I know I was carried on the wings of prayer. I know there were people back here in this church praying. I had friends praying. I've never felt so prayed for in my life. But something transacted. Something began to unlock. And on the Sunday I left and they said, we thought we needed Darren. But God gave us what we needed. And I was so humbled. And I went back and ministered to our students for another week, which was such a blessing. And I, I went on to KL and they, they asked me to do something else. And, I just saw God just show up in the most amazing ways. It wasn't Darren, but I know it wasn't Luke either. But I realized I stepped into something. And so I had these prophetic words and said, God, what does this look like? Darren's going to give me the answers. And God said, this is what your future looks like. And so I wanted to determine to step into that. Yeah. And I get home and, and Mark says to me, pray, I really feel like we should recognise the apostolic call in your life. Wow. Right? So this is like set up, guys. This is like set up. It's like it's cemented the thing that God has spoken to me. It's like it's locked in. And I want to, Steve videoed a little bit of the night and it's a little bit embarrassing, so but I want to share it with you because it's something that God's done, something's transacted in my heart, and I feel like I feel like my world's been unstopped and, and the vision and the dreams that have been crushed and brought back to life again and I feel like I have a mandate now to, to step into it and to pursue it and to put legs to it. And so, what he's done for me, he wants to do for each one of you. I thank Matt and Sue and just one of them. It's been an incredible journey. And, uh, you know, as a team, God's, God's, God's so transformed us. You know, we're in a, we're in a different place. Mark and Sue are different now than they were 12 months ago. You know, and they, they were so, so impacted 12 months ago when this recognition of, of who they are was bestowed upon them. And yet, the Philistines with shovels and they keep trying to fill their well. But we're going to keep digging. We're going to keep digging together. If we, if we can support one another, if we can recognise the grace upon someone else's life and, and begin to encourage them. Because that's what it's been about. It's about encouraging one another to find the thing that, that God has called you to be and called you to do in this season. And so as a leadership we've been transformed and, and, and as a church we're still in the process of of, of transformation, but I want to encourage you to continue to walk the journey and to, to continue to explore transformation in your own heart and life. Where What is God calling you to begin to flush your well and empower it to become a spring? We need the Holy Spirit more than ever.
why are we embarrassed our best friend? One of the floor, there's a lay on the floor in, in Brisbane. There was a, a sentence that came to me from one of the prophetic words I received earlier in the year. And it says this, it says, it's not a season for eking out, but it's a season for pushing out with great force and with great power. And so that we can just continue to exist and let it be and let it be. But God says it's time to rise up. It's time to push out. But it only comes as that, that river becomes a spring and let it flow out. So God bless you. Have a great week. Amen. Amen.